Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for, for turning up here straight after lunch. Hope you enjoyed your lunch break. So yeah, as I said, I'm from uh, QB. We are um, a company based in Amsterdam. We're currently around about uh, 160 people in, in total, um, of which uh, data science, data engineering, it's around about the 10, 12 people mark. So a relatively large team for the size of the, the company. To give you a little bit of an idea of our, our background, uh, so we are a company that was formed originally as Home Automation Europe back in 2004 with the aim of automating all of the um, control devices within the home. Uh, 2004 was a long, long time ago. It was before the iPhone was even a, even a concept. Um, so that the world was very, very different. We spent a number of years developing different uh, prototypes and, and launching smaller uh, pieces of hardware. A real breakthrough came in 2012 when we launched a, a product that we um, is called in the Netherlands uh, Tone, which is a, a smart thermostat um, and energy display. We launched this with a, a company called Eneco, which are one of the, the big three um, energy suppliers in the Netherlands. From there, we've, um, we've rebranded to, to call ourselves QB, have launched updated hardware earlier this year, and we're moving away from just the, the energy sector uh, into different sectors such as insurance and assisted living. Where are we right now? We've got uh, over 350,000 connected homes across Europe. The majority of these are in the Netherlands where we started. We also have a, a big partnership uh, there with Interpolis, which are one of the, the large uh, Dutch insurers. And that's where we have launched an insurance um, related proposition based on the same kind of hardware. We launched with NG Electrobel. Um, they're the biggest uh, energy company in, in Belgium. So that was been launched a couple of years ago. And just uh, last year, uh, we launched with Fiesco, who are one of the, the major uh, electricity companies in Spain. I want to give you a little bit of a flavor of our, our product, our hardware. So we, we offer a number of different hardware devices, uh, ranging from the just uh, energy inside, uh, just based on an app, all the way through to a, a smart meter dongle, so you can plug that into your, dong, into your smart meter, and that's a way of getting the, the data uh, back again and available. Our main uh, product, the one that we've, we've sold the most to date, is the, the smart thermostat and energy insight um, um, display. And I'll go into a little bit more detail in the following slides about that. Um, we've also launched our, our security package uh, just this summer, uh, that, that expands the hardware to include um, a, a camera, um, door sensors, movement sensors to uh, give a, a broader proposition. Something that's really close to my heart is how do you take the data uh, from these devices and make um, services that are uh, engaging and useful for end users. We've developed a number of services in the last, last few years. Um, so for example, the waste checker service, looking into water insight, all the way through to uh, monitoring the boiler. Today, I'm gonna dive into a little bit more detail on two of these use cases, of the, the waste checker and the boiler monitoring case, just to give you a, a bit of a flavor of what we've been doing um, from the, the more data-driven services perspective. Before we jump into that, give you a little bit of an idea of the kind of data we're getting. So we're, we're detecting from the, um, the, the thermostat and the, the energy display over 300 different types of sensor and user interaction data. So that includes the connection to the, the boiler. So we're able to control the, the boiler. That's typically in, in the Netherlands and Belgium. It's either a gas boiler or an oil heated boiler. Some boilers there just provide very limited information. Others have more advanced protocols where we're able to get a hundred different um, sensor points. So for example, pressures of the boiler, temperatures, uh, error messages. We also connect directly to the gas and electricity meter. Um, so we're able to connect both to the more modern smart meters where it, you can just plug in with a cable and get the data. But also we have the, the, the analog, um, uh, we have optical sensors that are able to read the, the old style analog meters, so either the spinning disc or the rotating digits. We, we've added uh, capabilities for uh, solar panels. So you can see in, in real time how much your, your solar panels are generating, uh, how much you're using within your home, and how much you're sending back to the grid. 
We've added a number of smart home features as well. So the ability to be able to control your um, smart lights, um, see smart smoke detectors, and add smart plugs to your various appliances around the home. We've been collecting this data for over a couple of years now. I, I did a quick check before heading off to the Spark Summit. We've, we've crossed the one petabyte mark. So there's, there's a lot of data in here. And as we see in some of the, the following slides, it's a very rich uh, data set. Even just a single data point, so for example, the electricity meter data is telling you everything about what's going on in that house at that time. So the, the challenge for us is, instead of having multiple sources of data trying to compile it together, is to, to try to extract relevant information from this very dense information source. Our data science platform, we, you won't be surprised to hear, we've built that around Spark at the core. We, we use Databricks as a platform to enable us to do that at scale. It's very good for uh, cluster management, uh, the shared notebook functionality, as well as simple things like um, plotting functions uh, and just being able to, to engage with the data in a very uh, friendly, interactive way. We, we're based on AWS. We, we use that for storing all of the, um, um, the data and, and doing some of the initial processing there. Typically, from a data science, data engineering perspective, we're using a, a combination of uh, Scala and Python. Actually, within the data science team, we've, we've moved quite a lot of our code from Python to Scala, and we actually do quite a lot now with the, the R&D already within uh, Scala. We found that that really helps us move very quickly to production. Uh, finally, just to mention, we're using Apigee for API management. Um, so we can offer the, the output of our data science algorithms to both uh, teams within the company, but also externally. Take you through a little bit of the, the approach we use to create data-driven services. So, so essentially what we start off there, we want to start with the desirability. So that is from the user perspective, what does the end user want? So from our point of view, the end user is typically the homeowner. It's the person that has the, the smart thermostat in the home, on, on the wall, in the living room. What do they want? What services can we offer them that gives them an extra benefit? Once you've got some indication of a, an idea of what the end user wants, then you move more towards the feasibility. What, what can you technically build? What's possible? What does the data allow? What kind? What, what can you create that gives you some approach to try to tackle this end user problem? Then once you've got those two, you're typically at the stage where you, you want to move to some kind of MVP. That's where you're really testing the, the viability. So it, in very simple terms, the combination you've got, can you sell it? Is it, is it attractive enough that someone is willing to pay to use the, the service? What we currently have with our, our uh, a way our, our business model typically works is there is there's an upfront cost for, for the hardware. Sometimes that is subsidized by the, the utility. So if you sign up for a multiple uh, year contract, then you're able to get the hardware for cheaper or even for free. Then we, on top of that, we have a, a monthly subscription fee. Uh, just to give you a flavor, in the, in the Netherlands, that's currently four euros 50. That enables you to control your heating remotely, but also uh, use all of the, the different data-driven services, two of which I'm uh, showing today. First example of this I'd like to show a little bit more detail is what we call the, the waste checker. What we're trying to do here is we work very closely with utility partners. So we need to work with them, and what they really want to do is they want to increase the engagement that they have with their end customers. So typically, um, a utility has a, a once-a-year relationship. They, they send a bill through, the, the person who receives the bill looks at it, looks a little bit away in shock and goes, ah, oh, that's painful, and then thinks about going onto some kind of price comparison site and thinking, oh, okay, which, which uh, utility can I move to for the next year? That's not what our, our partners want. They want to find a way to reduce churn to build a longer-term, more engaging relationship. What we found is that by, by offering both um, historical energy insights, so the ability to, to look into the past to see your um, graphs of your, your consumption, that offers a little bit more engagement with the end user. It offers a little bit more potential for, for energy saving. Because from the, from the homeowner's perspective, they don't care about how engaged they are with their, with their uh, energy provider. 
one thing that can really trigger people is how much um, energy can they save in their home. So by massaging the, these two together, you can, you can build combinations that are beneficial both for the utility and the homeowner. The, the next step there is really moving towards real-time information. So within our, our app and on our display that's typically mounted in the living room, we're able to show people in real-time how much electricity, how much gas they're using. That allows people to, to react on things. So for example, they can, they can see when they're turning on the oven exactly how much energy that's using. But that is not, that's not really engaging for a, a large number of users. There's some people that will, will really, really love seeing the data and act upon it. But what we found is that for the, the majority of the, our user base, beyond the sort of the 5% that are really actively engaged in energy saving and they, they want to look into the numbers, the, the, the others, they, they need something that's easily digestible. So what we've moved there is towards what we call appliance level diagnostics. So this, I will explain a little bit more. We have developed a product that we call the energy waste checker. What this does is looks into the details in seven different appliances and gives advice to people on when, they, when they're wasting energy. So it's a, it's a subtle different framing as well. A lot of people are not so engaged with uh, energy efficiency because everyone starts thinking, well, I don't know where like uh, three sweaters in the house just to keep myself warm. You want to, you want to have your, your comfort, but you also don't want to just be, be burning money, just throwing away money for the sake of it. This service we, we launched to all Aneco customers in the Netherlands at the, the end of last year. Uh, and this will be launched um, in our customers in, in Belgium in the coming months. What this does is we, we basically take uh, data, uh, both from the electricity, the gas, the thermostat, and the boiler data, run various algorithms on that, and are able to give uh, advice to end users of whether their appliance is, is efficient or inefficient. So very, a, a simple just green-red classification. We currently offer seven different uh, use cases. So looking into the, the, the washing machine, uh, dryer, uh, fridge, dishwasher, uh, as well as the, the standby or the always-on consumption. A couple of really interesting cases are also on the advice on the, the heating and on the, the hot water usage. Typically, in the majority of European homes, up to 80% of all energy consumption within the residential sector is on, on gas. What I want to dive into a little bit more is what we do with the electricity data. So we, a key technology we have is what we call load disaggregation algorithms. The job of those algorithms is essentially you've got this one stream of data coming in, electricity data, and you want to split that into the different appliance signals. This is an example of, of data. This is actually from my home. So this is one day of 10 second electricity data. We can run our algorithms on that. We're looking for particular patterns. So we're picking out the, the washing machine here. You can see it starts with a, a large period of using a lot of energy. That's where it's heating up the water. Then it starts to spin around a bit. And if you look very closely at the end of the cycle, it starts spinning very fast. So it's these kind of characteristics that allow us to pick out the, the different appliances within the home. We can also see the, the dryer. There's a number of different uh, ways that dryers use energy. And I think in, in the Netherlands, there's at least four main categories there. Uh, the dishwasher has uh, its own unique pattern as well. And we're able to expand this out and offer uh, even more detection. So for example, here I, I've shown the, the refrigerator in red just at the nighttime hours only. That's also operating throughout the day. We, we can see when uh, people are using uh, kitchen appliances. So for example, um, uh, 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 like a, a cooker. So you, you use that for like heating hot water within the home or a microwave and those kind of appliances. Have to add, uh, our users do try to make this complicated for us. Um, the, the previous example, everything was nicely uh, next to each other. Here, this is another example from my home. Put on the washing machine, then a dryer, another washing machine, yet another dryer, another washing machine, yet another dryer, another washing machine, all at the same time on top of each other. Put a dishwasher on just for fun. And in case you haven't been keeping track, we needed to dry the final load of clothes. So when all of the, these data points there's a, uh, interacting with each other, it gets more and more difficult to separate the individual appliances. But the approaches we've taken, both a combination of machine learning and deep learning uh, approaches, allow us to, to make these individual detections of appliances.
How do we go from those individual detections to offering uh, an uh, efficiency classification? So first of all, we, we take uh, every day, we, we run on a, a batch process at the end of the day to analyze the electricity data of all of our users. We then pick out the, um, the, the individual times these appliances have been used. Then we look back over a number of weeks or a number of months to find what we call a fingerprint of the appliance. So we're looking to see the way that users are, are mostly engaging with that. So this is an example from the dishwasher. And we can see for this home, there's, there's three different patterns of, of usage. Uh, two uh, yellow points where typically this would be associated more with the, the eco program. And then you've got a, a red point that is probably more on the, the intense mode of the dishwasher. What we um, then offer is we want to compare this either with uh, industry standards, so that's typically within the EU, the energy labels. So we can say, for example, anything from a, a double plus and above appliance can be treated as efficient or not. Uh, that's efficient and below would be inefficient. What we see also that we're getting a lot more information from our, our detections than you typically have for the when the EU energy labels are being determined. So we're seeing how people are really using their appliances in the homes rather than just how appliances are behaving in a lab situation. What we do there, so we make, we make a comparison and what it's really important to do to pick out. So for example, with the dishwasher, it could be, as I said earlier, you could be using a really intense mode for your every cycle, but it could also be that your, your dishwasher is just 15 years old. It's just really inefficient at heating up water. That's where we engage in a dialogue with our, our customers, and that's where we can begin to understand and give them real targeted advice on how they can make changes within, their, within the home to improve the, the energy efficiency and prevent them wasting energy. To give you a little bit of an idea of the scale, every day we're detecting 75,000 dishwasher cycles. That's, in 2018 so far, that's around 20 million dishwasher detections we're making. If you take those dishwashers just for one day, run them end to end consecutively, it would take 13 years for them to finish. So we're, we're accumulating a vast, vast amount of information about dishwashers, washing machines, home appliances. I, I'm always a little bit loath to use the words uh, big data. One thing I know for sure is we know a lot about dishwashers and washing machines. That's, there's no doubt there. Uh, a key thing to, to note is that over 25% of these devices, the dishwashers, are being used inefficiently. So there's, there's a huge amount of savings. It's, it's an even higher amount for, for washing machine. But a lot of people don't realize the, that you're, if you're washing at 40 degrees rather than 30 degrees, you're almost using twice as much energy in many cases. So just, just to lighten things up a little bit, I think it's time for a little bit of a, a pop quiz. Uh, anyone have a guess what the... Based on our, our Dutch data, what's the most popular day of the week to do the laundry? Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday. Sunday. It's very close with Saturday, though. Five million of the 27 million uh, washing machine detections so far. Sunday, uh, what Saturday comes in at 4.9, real close. We're, so this gives a little bit of a flavor for what we're able to detect. We can even drill down a little bit further. 10 o'clock Sunday morning, that is the peak time for putting on your, your washing machine. It's even, you, I, I could go on for this for hours. You can look into the, the dishwasher. Um, for those of you that are familiar with, with Dutch people, you will know that six o'clock is dinner time. At 6.39, that is the peak time to start the dishwasher. That's, that's the level of detail we can get into. Um, the second use case I wanted to highlight is the, um, what we call detecting uh, anomalies in heating systems. So we, we already have a, a product in the market that's called a boiler monitoring service. What we're doing there is we're, we're giving um, reminders of when maintenance is, is necessary on a boiler. And also for those types of boiler that send us more detailed information, we're able to give um, uh, error notifications and we can uh, send a, an SMS or a, a push notification within an app to, to tell people exactly what they, they need to do. So we can, we can make it very easy for them to get in, in contact with a, an installation company. A lot of people have subscription contracts with installation companies and we can make that process very easy. 
There are a lot of boilers, particularly outside of the Netherlands, but also a, a large percentage uh, within that base, that we get very limited information from the boiler. All we're really seeing is whether it's switched on or switched off. So what we wanted to do is enhance our service to be able to pick out these anomalies in the heating system based on the information we've got coming in. So what we're able to do there, we're, we're monitoring in real time both the, um, the, the temperature, which is typically in the living room, and we're combining that with the, the data we know from the thermostat itself, whether it's, we know whether it's asking for heat or not. We are then looking for periods where the thermostat is asking for heat, but the room isn't heating up. This could be for a, a wide variety of reasons. It could be that the boiler is broken, but it could also be that uh, all of the radiators are switched off, all of the valves are switched off, or it could just be all of the windows are open. But in most of these situations, it's something that the end user will, will really benefit from being notified about. So what we're then doing, we're, we're looking um, to see the typical behavior of this home over time. We're looking at seeing when it leaves its normal operating range. And then from there, we're, we're able to, when we get into this sort of Bermuda triangle of danger, then we can send some, we make a decision whether that's severe enough to, to send an alert to the end user. That typically takes the form of a, an SMS notification on a mobile phone. Uh, one thing I wanted to, to highlight is the, um, some of the, the difficulties we've had with, with doing this. So we've, we've been working with uh, Spark Streaming, uh, implementing this on the Databricks Delta platform. That works very well. That, that allows us to do things that were not possible before. One of the struggles we have um, is when working with, with streams, it's not possible to do multiple aggregations. So if you look uh, carefully at this, um, uh, this diagram, we, we essentially, this, this top um, flow is really about our, our waste checker uh, processing the data there. But then we're, we're, we're taking the data here, we're storing it in a, a delta table, we're splitting it, and then combining it again. It's, it works, it's fine, but it's not particularly, not particularly glamorous. Now's a bit of a, an advert. My, my colleague Ernie, who's sitting down here at the front, he's going to be giving a talk uh, tomorrow, uh, also at 2 o'clock. He's going to be going into a little bit more of the details from the, the machine learning engineer perspective on all of these use cases. So if you've got more, more questions, interested to learn more, I encourage you to, to speak to Ernie or come along to his talk tomorrow. What I wanted to, to wrap up um, from our, our process of developing these data-driven services at scale We've been, we've been now in production with the waste checker that's been running for, for almost a year now. So we, we've gone through the whole cycle of coming out with an initial concept, taking that through various MVPs, productionizing it, then, then operating that service. What are the, the big five things we've learned? One, spark for time series. That's great for us. Particularly, uh, just to give one example, the, the window functions. That allows us to very very easily work with time series data. That has meant uh, that we've been able to be quite efficient in, in the way that we're, we're operating. Um, what we also do, we, from a data science perspective, we started off with, with a team that were, were had backgrounds in, in R, Python, Java, MATLAB. We initially started working just on Python. We, we found that that was a good way of engaging doing, doing R&D work. As now we've moved towards a, a production setting, what we find there is that we, there's a huge benefit to us to speed up the, the time of deployment. So now we're, we're doing a lot more about R&D um, uh, directly in Scala. We're, we're building up some, some capabilities there that, that essentially blur that distinction between data science and data engineering. We heard a lot in the keynotes this morning that there, there typically is a, there's, there's a time that it gets handed over from, from a data scientist that's developed some, some model in, in R or Python and it's dumped on the desk of a data engineer to, to productionize. What we've been able to do within our, our team is to, to blur the boundaries there. And I'd say really we've got the, the three roles now of data scientist, uh, then working with machine learning engineers, then working with data engineers. And that, that eases the transition through quite nicely. Uh, thirdly, we, we now really, we say we live in the cloud. Uh, so the, 
particularly working with um, the AWS platform and um, Databricks. It allows us to free up some of our data engineering talent to focus on the problems where they can really add value for our company. We can really quickly access things like cluster timeouts, auto-scaling, spot, in spot instances without having to have additional FTEs spending all of their time just maintaining the infrastructure. Even when we had a very small scale Hadoop cluster a couple of years back, we were spending so much of our time just that there's a new package comes along that we need to spend a, a few days installing, like managing dependencies. This allows us to, to free up those data engineers so then they can really be concentrating on bringing our machine learning algorithms into production, maintaining systems in production and really adding value for the company. Another big lesson, getting to production, it's not the end. Going through this whole cycle, probably developing the data science algorithms, in retrospect, that looks like the easy bit. That's the bit you can control. That's the bit where you've got the data coming in, you're in your, your own comfort zone. When you're, you're launching these services, you've got hundreds of thousands of people giving feedback. They're going to give some positive feedback. They're going to give ne negative feedback. But one thing you need to do is you need to react and build upon that feedback. What, one uh, interesting case to highlight is we, we originally designed this waste checker service around uh, targeting where people were wasting energy in their homes, giving them uh, insight into which appliances were inefficient. Users came back to us and said, well, it's great that you, you pick out the inefficient appliances, but I want to know more about my efficient appliances. So then we, we developed a, a couple of additional models that were able to detect some of the, the more efficient dryers on the market, such as heat pump dryers. Uh, finally, uh, lesson number five, full stack data science works really well for us. So this is working with, with teams that are responsible for the, the initial R&D concepts, building that, running it, being really engaged with the, the services that end users will love. You don't want to be putting data scientists, data engineers just in a, just in a sealed room and not, not giving them that feedback and interaction with the end user. That's something that by doing this, we've really been able to, to operate, build these services at scale, continually learn from it, and make services that our end users really love. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, we have a couple minutes for some questions. If anybody back there. I have a question about, uh, so you have a lot of uh, data about uh, different heaters uh, or washing machines, for example. Uh -huh. And I guess you, at some point, you, you find out there are more there are washing machines that are as efficient as claimed and some that are not as efficient. Mm -hmm. What do you do with this, this information or do you do something with that? Very interesting. Yeah, uh, we, we do have a lot of information. Uh, currently, we're, we're not working, so for example, with any uh, manufacturers to, to, to give them their feedback. But I, I feel that it's something that it's an extra layer that we can build upon the data. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a lot of insight into how um, uh, appliances are behaving differently in the real world than they do in, in the lab tests. We're actually working with a university in Germany that's doing a has been doing a lot of work over the years of actually conducting these tests. They're really interested to understand how they can uh, better do testing in the lab environment to better simulate usage in the real world. So that's one step that we're taking in that direction. I, I think in the, in the future, it would be really interesting to, to explore whether our users would be interested in getting advice on if they need to buy a new washing machine, which appliances would be mess, most suitable for their situation. That's something that we would consider looking into, but it's not something we've done to date. Um, you mentioned and you talk about going external with some of the API services. Mm -hmm. Could you just give a bit more detail on what do you mean by going external, and is it sort of other manufacturers that are use, consuming those, or is it? Um, so a, a good a good example of this is um, we're, we're typically building the um, the app functionality uh, in house, um, so we're able to offer the the output from our APIs internally to that that team. We also work with utilities that often have their, their own app and own engagement with uh, end users. So working through APIs allows us to, to enable that utility to have some of the insight from our, our products 
within their own, their own app. It's important for you, different utilities have different strategies of exactly how they want to engage with their end users. For a lot of them, via their own branded app is a, a very valuable way of, of bringing people in to, and wanting to learn more about Energy Insight. So that's a, a concrete example of how we use it. Uh, hi. Um, first of all, very good presentation. Uh, I have one question, like, uh, for example, the existing uh, boilers and, you know, the heating system which mm -hmm. are already running, how do you uh, collect the data from those systems, basically? I mean, when there is some tune, I mean, the product user, and he wants to interact with the already existing infrastructure in his, fa in his home, how do you basically get start collecting the data to that, from that? Uh, let me... Yes, yeah, so if we, we're looking here, basically we're, when we're, we're connecting up our, our hardware within the home, typically the thermostat that's at the, the center is, um, is, is connected uh, where, the, where the old thermostat used to be. It's typically a, a wired connection in the living room. We're then able to get the, the information, say, from, from the boiler. That that's typically comes over through a, through a wire or a wireless um, uh, connection. So then we're building up a picture of how the the user is using their appliances over time. So then we, it means we need to have a certain amount of historic data to be able to then offer advice to end users. It's we're able to see some high level information. So for example, uh, through smart meter data, we would be able to see at a a lower resolution how people have been using electricity and gas in the past, but until they have our, our hardware on premise, then we're not able to see really in detail. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, th thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding um, the use case that you mentioned, uh, detecting anomalies in, the, in, in boilers. Yes. Uh, so th there is a user interface, so user can see the uh, notifications, right? So mm -hmm. how how often does it happen, actually? How 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 useful is it for the for the customer? I mean, if it breaks once in ten years, so probably that's not very relevant. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. a it's a good question. Um, so we we have a lot of insight from that from the um, uh, from the boilers that are actually reporting the errors directly to us. So we can see from that, from the, from the last few years, exactly which kind of errors are most likely to happen. It's, um, it's a surprising amount. I, I think for, for a user on average, we're talking in terms of, it's typically once in every three or four years, they can expect a, a real boiler failure. Uh, but we see things that there can be uh, issues with the heating system, particularly at the start of the year, this kind of time of the year, where people have maybe uh, not, uh, not opened the radiators fully from closing it down in the, in the summer, or there's a lot of air in the, in the system, and there's, there's a lot of simple things that they can do to fix it themselves without having to get a boiler engineer around. So that's why we're able to give some uh, a little bit more advice. You can, you can optimize and tweak your, your own system without having to rely on the, uh, the boiler installer coming to fix the really big problems. Thank you. Thanks again, Stephen. Okay. Thank you very much.